Now for the next part of this video, I've gone ahead and opened up Photoshop as well as I found an image online of this weight bench, which is the asset that we're going to start with inside of 3ds Max using only primitives to create. Now if I double click on this image here inside of the, my Windows browser, I'll get a bigger view of our reference image. And if we start with just sort of basically breaking down the majority of the shapes on this object, we can see that alongside here we have something that looks kind of like boxes along these sides here, some more boxes here, maybe like a small sphere or something to kind of represent this bolt. Along the top here we could probably use a chamfer box and then obviously along the top where we have the weights themselves, these are basically just cylinders. The large pole that we have across here, this could probably be a tube and maybe some more spheres and cylindrical shapes along the sides for support pieces. Now as you start looking at everyday objects in your everyday life, you'll definitely start to notice just how versatile using some of those basic 3D primitives can be in order to achieve some of the generic shapes that you want. Now if we take a look at this image, you notice that it's a little bit large along the left to the right. There's a little bit of excess space over here. And what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to take this into Photoshop and crop it just slightly so that I can use this as a reference image. This is sort of a personal preference and you can pretty much use any image or picture that you want or any object around your house, for example, to get started with. But for now, let's take a look inside of Photoshop at cropping this image so that it's a little bit less excessive along the edges. And then next we're going to take it inside of 3ds Max and use it as a reference plane so that we can view this image just inside of 3ds Max while we work on it. So just to get you familiar with that process, I'm going to start by minimizing this window. And here inside of Photoshop, once you have it opened up, almost regardless of which version of Photoshop you have, you can open images and edit images with a lot of the same tools and features that have been around for a while. Now in some of the later versions of Photoshop, they do offer a lot of new tools and a lot of new functions that aren't available in some of the older ones. But when it comes to basic image manipulation of cropping and selecting and some basic painting tools, these are pretty much the standard that have been around for quite a while. For now, we'll just open that image and crop it to the size that we want so that when we bring it into 3ds Max and use it as our reference plane we don't have a lot of excess on the sides. So we'll start by clicking on File, Open, and then make sure that you browse to the image wherever it was that you saved it on your hard drive. We'll go ahead and double click it and this will bring up our image. Now if you're completely new to Photoshop essentially the basics of it are along the top here you have your menu bar where you can open files make some basic adjustments through editing, some image properties, and the layer tools. And we'll be talking considerably about Photoshop throughout this course, but for now we'll just get you started with basic image manipulation such as cropping. And so now that you've opened up your image here, along the right hand side you see that you have your layer panel, and then along the left side here this is the majority of your tools that you'll be using. So to move the window around here inside of Photoshop, all you need to do is hold down the left mouse button along the top, and you can also scale it just slightly up and down by holding down the left mouse button and clicking here in the bottom corner. Now when you scale and move this around, this doesn't actually adjust the image itself, it just adjusts the viewport that you have as you are looking at the image itself. You can also minimize it and maximize it and you can close this little workspace that we have here in this window. Now to crop this image, what we want to do is along the left hand side you'll see this icon here where it looks like two L-shaped bars uh, sort of crisscrossing each other. By left clicking on that, that'll select the crop tool and all you need to do is hold down the left mouse button and drag select an area that you want to crop out. After you select an area, you'll notice that along the side it's sort of grayed out a little bit and this is giving you a bit of a preview to kind of let you know how much of it you're cropping off. Now the point of this is to sort of frame the image just slightly so that we don't have all this excess white space. It kind of minimizes the real estate that this picture will take inside of 3ds Max when we go back in there and use this to model with. So we'll find a nice little bit of an area that looks like it's pretty well framed. We wouldn't want to crop parts of it off for example, so we'll, we'll get right around about in the center of it. And once you're happy with your cropped range, all you need to do is double left mouse click anywhere in the screen in the center of your cropped area. So there you go. So for now we'll save this file out by clicking File, Save, and this will overwrite the original image that we had. And so from here we can go ahead and close this image and close Photoshop.
And so here inside of 3ds Max, I've gone ahead and reset our scene so that we have a brand new, fresh open area here in the viewport. And what I want to do is, in this instance, since I don't have a second monitor, I'm going to go ahead and create that plane that we talked about so that we'll actually have a copy of that picture here in our 3D viewport to help us as we model. Now, if you had a second monitor, you could easily just keep the reference image off to the right-hand side on your other screen. You could also just toggle back and forth. This isn't necessarily mandatory, but it is a common technique to go ahead and get a picture inside of your 3D space so that you can quickly go back and forth from looking at your reference and looking at your model as you start working on your mesh. So to start with, I'm going to go ahead and click on the Maximize Viewport Toggle down here in the bottom right-hand corner. And I'm just going to look inside the perspective view so that we can get into the habit of quickly going back and forth between our viewports using our hotkeys. And so the first thing I want to do is I want to create a plane that I can apply that image to. Now the fastest way that I can think of doing this right now is if I want to switch my viewport to the front view by pressing F, it's the hotkey for front, I'll left click on plane, and then hold down the left mouse button and just sort of drag out the plane here in this view. Now we don't know the exact parameters of length and width just yet for the image that we had because we don't want the image to be stretched or squashed. So I'm just going to kind of eyeball it first, drag out a plane, and then apply the image, and then I can fix these parameters to make sure that the scale is exactly correct. Now if I right-click, exit out of plane, creation mode, if I press G, this will get rid of the grid. That's the hotkey for toggling the grid on and off. Now what I want to do is I want to bring up the material browser. And you can do that by clicking up in the top right-hand corner up here. There's a, a checker pattern circle with a box around it. This brings up the material browser. You can also use the hotkey of M. If you press M on and off, that toggles the material browser. And when you first see it, what you are looking at, this is the Slate Material Editor. And this is a little bit more advanced with a node-based system that's a little bit newer in some of the later versions of 3ds Max. My preference is, is going into Modes, the Compact Material Editor. This has been around a bit longer, and I'm a little bit more comfortable with it. So we'll start with this one, and in later chapters talk a little bit more about the node-based material system. Now to go back and forth, you can always left-click on Mode and switch back and forth between the ones that you want. So what I'm looking at here is these are basic material balls which give you a little bit of a pre-rendered sample of what your texture looks like inside of a sort of a pseudo 3D object. Now you could look at it, for example, as a cylinder or a square by left mouse clicking on this icon up here in the top right under the sample type to get a better idea of what it is that your material is going to look like. Now basically what a material is, is it is a compilation of two-dimensional textures and parameters that we can apply onto a surface to make it look like something. So for example, if we wanted to make bricks on this plane, we could get a two-dimensional texture, just like what we did with our weight bench, but it would, it would be bricks, obviously, and we would apply those bricks to the plane. And this node up here essentially resembles how that surface is going to look like before you apply it to your object. So for now, all we need to do is we just need to create a material that is our picture of our weight bench so that we can put it on this plane. Now the basics of how that work, for right now, all we are going to have to worry about is the diffuse color slot. Now if you get confused between what ambient is, diffuse, and specular, not to worry too much. For right now, if you just can remember that diffuse is color or textures, that's a good place to start. And as we start to get a little bit more advanced with the material system, some of this terminology will start to make a little bit more sense. Now here in the diffuse, you'll notice that we have this color picker. I can left click on this color picker, and this will bring up a menu where I could change the color back and forth. And as I do, you'll notice that the material ball is updating itself to represent the colors that I'm changing to. Now not to be confused with the colors over here on the far right hand side, this is simply an object color that once you've applied a material color to it, this material color will override that color choice that you had. So for example, if I wanted to have a purple pinkish plane object, I could switch that color, press OK, and with this material ball selected, I can either hold down the left mouse button and drag it onto the object, or I can click this button here, the green square with the circle that is assigned material to selection. And so now if we look at our plane, our plane looks very similar to this purple ball that we have here. 
So instead of using a color as our diffuse, we want to use a 2D texture image. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this little box here next to the word diffuse, and this is basically an input slot. If I left click on that, a new window will pop up looking for some form of map type to go into that diffuse slot. Now what we want to do is we want to apply what's known as a bitmap. Now not to be confused with an image file format that is also called bitmap, that's simply a, another word of saying, hey, we want to use a 2D texture image. Rather than some of these other parameters, which are essentially mathematical and visual material types that you can apply instead. So for now, we'll go ahead and left click on bitmap. And if you've been using your project folders and you have your image in the correct place, or even if you don't, you'll just need to navigate to that image. Just double click on it. And there we go. Now our weight bench reference image is the material that we have here and if we drag it onto our surface you'll notice that as soon as you drag it on or you apply it it's not updating right away you may ask yourself well the color updated why isn't this updated when using 2d textures it starts to get a little bit more complex and so what you have to do is you have to toggle this button here which is show shaded material in viewport so when you click that button if you give it a few seconds you'll see that image show up on your 3D object. And so with this image applied, what we want to do now is we want to make sure that the ratio of the plane is actually the same ratio as the object that we have from our 2D picture. For example, if it was stretched too much, we would start creating an asset that wasn't the exact same scale or the proper size of the original 2D picture that we took. So we want to make sure that we correct this. Now there are a lot of different ways of ensuring that it's precise but one quick method that I have is inside of Photoshop if you simply click on image image size this tells you exactly how wide and how tall this picture is so if we know it's 575 by 406 we can go back to 3ds max and with our plane selected we can type in those parameters here and there we go. And now we know that the plane is the exact same size and dimensions of our original image back here inside of Photoshop. So we can hit OK and minimize out of Photoshop and the plane is going to be the correct scale. So for now we're done with the material browser. We can exit out of this and I'm going to switch this to a perspective view and bring the grid back up. And once we've created this size at the correct ratio we can scale the entire image all the way down just by holding down the left mouse button here in the center of the scale tool and then using the move tool we'll just sort of position this plane somewhere here inside of 3ds space now I'm quickly toggling back and forth with our move rotate and scale hotkeys until we find a good position somewhere along sort of the back area here and as I work on our 3D object here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be doing it out here along the grid in front of the picture. And so one thing that is going to be helpful is as we start creating primitives and 3D objects, we want to be careful that we don't accidentally grab this picture and start moving it around or accidentally scale it and rotate it in some strange way. So what we can do is we can actually freeze this image so that it is always here inside of our 3D space and we don't accidentally manipulate it unintentionally. And so to do that, if we right-click on the image, we have this flyout menu box that comes up. And if we left-click on Object Properties, this brings up properties specific to the individual thing that you have selected. And what we're looking for is down here along the bottom left-hand side where it says Show Frozen in Gray. And the reason why we want to toggle this is there's another option here where if we right-click Freeze Selection, this allows us to freeze the object so that we can no longer select it, but as you see, it's grayed out and the image has disappeared. So let's right-click, unfreeze all, right-click, object properties, and we'll go ahead and uncheck show frozen in gray, press OK, and then freeze that plane again. Now it's unselectable, but it's also frozen in place. So now we're ready to get started actually modeling out this object.